That's more than four Niagara Falls worth of power that's going to have to be replaced and then double it to keep up with the demand by 2050. Combined, these forces will drive an extraordinary and rapid evolution in power grid by 2050. We cannot and will not get to net zero without massive amounts of energy. At its heart, this project is a climate change initiative, a clean energy initiative that will assist with orderly transition away from Ontario's reliance on fossil fuels. Not only is this a climate change project, but also represents one of the largest Indigenous reconciliation initiatives currently underway in Canada. If this project moves forward, it will be only through a partnership with the South Indian Association. We've made a commitment to the Chippewas of Maywatch on State of First Nation and the Chippewas of Stockton First Nation that we will not proceed with this project unless it's through their support and their partnership. This facility becomes as much a Saudi Ojibwe Nation asset as it does ours. Our prospective partners will have a significant equity ownership and active roles in the management and environmental stewardship of this program. We have made commitments to ensuring that they have opportunities for employment, training, contracting, supplying of this program, including wraparound services uh, in order to support those workers um, at the site. Through their own investments of their own capital, this project would earn them a stable, long-term source of revenue that would have significant impacts on improving services, infrastructure, and quality of life within those two nations. I want to stress, from day one, Co-ownership and co-management between industry and Indigenous partners is a first for me. This project will be a source of pride and key for their economic self-determination. In the words of Chief Greg Najwan, this investment has the potential to change the Saudi Ojibwe nation from managing poverty to managing prosperity. And it provides an excellent opportunity for you to advance Indigenous reconciliation with their Saudi Ojibwe nation. There are some that point to existing facilities like in Wellington, Michigan, as bad examples of hydro pump storage, but there are some important, important facts to keep in mind. First, while the function and role of what we are proposing in Niebuhr is similar to Wellington, the design of our project could not be more different. Federal officials, the Saudi Ojibwe Nation, and KC Energy have visited Wellington, Michigan to learn from their experience as a direct result of our review of Wellington, and more importantly, the feedback that we have received already from the residents of Niebuhr, both the Cottager Association, the Saudi Ojibwe Nation, national and regional environmental groups, have completely redesigned this program and a relaunch of this project in 2021. Unlike Wellington, all major facilities of our design are effectively placed underground or underwater, and are especially our inlet outlet system that actually interact with those events. It will be a state of the art when it comes to connecting fish and fish habitat to the water quality of those events. We have listened and we have made significant changes based on what we heard from local residents and indigenous nations. Changes that have added costs to this facility, but that we deem were essential to demonstrate the sincerity of our efforts to address concerns that we've heard. Secondly, Others may have failed to mention that Wellington performs very important function in the electricity system in Michigan. That critical resource is a balancing act for Michigan's electric electricity system, especially important in integrating its renewable energy that Michigan has and is planning to add to. And after a multi year assessment by the Federal Energy Regulator in the United States, it was re licensed in 2019 for another 50 years of operation. I should also add that the state of Michigan and the U.S. Department of Energy have announced plans to proceed with reopening the Palisade nuclear plant in Michigan as a direct result of the need for zero emissions electricity in, in the United States. We recently had a conversation with the mayor, with Wellington's mayor, Mark Barnett, who expressed how this facility's tax revenue and spending has helped Wellington keep their schools and roads open and also well maintained. He's noted that Wellington's robust seasonal tourism recreational boating and fishing industries on Lake Michigan have been supported by this facility through their scenic outlooks, trails, and the development of a fisheries trust that supports their thriving fishing community 
and the facility's employees to bring their families and friends to vacation in Wellington. I would encourage you to reach out to Mayor Barnett and Steve Wellington uh, to hear this directly for yourself, including their spectacular fishing derbies in Wellington. When it comes to long duration energy storage at scale, pumps, hydro storage is the optimal solution to one The cost and environmental footprint to replicate our project using chemical batteries such as lithium ion will be significantly higher than the overall life cycle of impact is considered, such as mining, manufacturing, transportation, installation, replacement, and also disposal of, of toxic substances to chemical batteries. Rate payers have been concerned about costs and rate payer value. We share that concern. We also know the independent electricity system operator in Ontario, the Ontario Energy Board, and the Minister of Energy also share these concerns deeply. This is why the Minister of Energy wrote to the independent electricity operator in January this year regarding this project and provided further direction to clarify that value. The Minister of Energy has made it clear, similar to hydro dams and nuclear power stations, this project must benefit all Ontarians. Sarah Beasley is circulating uh, the letter that uh, Minister Smith sent to the independent electricity operator uh, earlier this year, so you can see this directly for yourself. <clears throat> we need to make sure this project provides an overall economic benefit to Ontario before it moves forward. And that process is outlined as prudent, appropriate, and it makes, it makes for an informed final decision on advancing this program. I should also add on March uh, 19th of this year, um, the uh, Ontario Internet Electricity Operator released their annual outlook report on how to plan for Ontario's energy future. And essentially their outlook report confirms the need for long-term storage to meet the zero emissions targets of Ontario that's both in, uh, in front of us. We are continuing to work with the Ministry of Energy and the Ontario Energy Board to establish a long-term commercial framework for the storage. We expect that the project will be rate regulated, we, which ensures the project provides Ontario residents and businesses with cost prudency, transparency, flexibility, and fairness, and the lowest possible cost. Under this well-established model, the risk and cost of going to market to assume debt and a range of viable financial models to build and operate this facility will be the responsibility of the proponents, PC Energy and the Saudi Ojibwe Nation. We will be responsible for that construction debt. We will be responsible for that financial model, not the rate payers of Ontario. In return, through rate regulation, eligible costs, the Ontario Energy Board being prudently incurred, will be reimbursed over a multi decade long process with a sustainable rate of return already provided to Ontario Power Generation, Hydro One, Bruce Power, among others. All that the Southern Ojibwe Nation and PC Energy is asking is to be treated the same as these other operators. The development of new energy projects can be challenging. Change can be harder. I'm reminded of President Kennedy's moon shot speech in 1962 when describing why the United States go to the moon. To paraphrase, we go to the moon not because it is easy, but because it is hard. We collectively, right now, have a, a responsibility to think about how we get to net zero, how we achieve meaningful indigenous participation with the treaty partners, and how we, we secure a safe and prosperous Ontario in Canada for the next generation. Our proposed project represents an opportunity and a solution to actually address climate change, represents a meaningful and real indigenous reconciliation initiative represents a made in Ontario energy security solution. I ask you again to not look at PC Energy's responses and facts, but to look for the facts yourselves. We encourage you to contact Mayor Mark Burnett at Lovington, contact the independent electricity operator, contact Premier Ford, contact the federal government, and contact the Saudi Ojibwe Nation to hear directly for yourself about the facts. Thank you for your time and um, I'll take any questions if you're comfortable. All right, thank you. Uh, I, I don't know anything about Lovington. Lovington? Yeah. Uh, but what's the difference between your project? Like, well, how, how is this different? Uh, 
uh, you know, uh, through uh, through the chair. So the so the uh, town of Lumington is roughly ten thousand people. Um, Meaford municipality is roughly ten thousand. Uh, the town of Ludington is uh, just south of Traverse City on the uh, Lake Michigan side of South Michigan, represented on northern Michigan. Um, so it's a very similar uh, geography to the in this part of the world. And as you can imagine, it also has a very strong seasonal tourism base um, with, their, with their municipality. Uh, the project itself, um, that facility in Ludington was built in like the late 1960s not, and started operating in the early 1970s. In fact, it has just celebrated its 50th year of operation. Uh, the construction of that project is was in the early 70s uh, completely different than what was proposed. So, for example, uh, their reservoir that they have uh, created in um, in Wellington um, it is uh, above uh, above Lake Michigan, and it has above ground conveyances or tunnels that you uh, that are covered by lawn from that reservoir down to an above ground power. That you can see on the lake shore. And then, furthermore, their water intake system, a very traditional water intake system where you have one single pipe or access that sticks out into the lake, and then you bring water in and push water out um, through that one access point. Um, our facility, however, um, is being proposed to be very, very different. Uh, we will have a reservoir um, uh, that will be above uh, the lake. However, our conveyances will be there. Uh, so we'll have underground tunneling systems, so nothing on the surface of the facility will be exposed. Um, our power house, instead of being at the lake shore, will be buried into like the Niagara Starlands, so it'll be invisible. And furthermore, um, our water intake, instead of having one central point to move water in and out, it'll be an underground buried dispersed water intake, where we'll have underground tunneling systems into about 800 meters in the deep water, where we'll have them a, um, a loop. You can see here on the screen, um, um, a loop that would be about a kilometer and a half in diameter. And from that loop, about 20 risers sticking up from like the lake bank, you'd be operating almost like a super filter, uh, where you're just slowing down the water and dispersing the water. Our uh, computer modeling has indicated the rate of water movement would be roughly one kilometer an hour, which is the same currents as novel side of day, uh, where this uh, facility will be located. So there's a very important uh, distinction between the public side of Wellington and what we're proposing here. Okay. So the, the, the different values and the one in case, out of case, the different values of that is, is like, what was it like? Uh, 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 a lot of um, uh, uh, individuals have pointed to one central point of intake that you're uh, concentrating the water in one location, but so you're basically pushing water at a higher rate than like the current rate of public lake, and so it's a rapidity, for example, sediment to pick up the disturbance of uh, fish, uh, uh, fish habitat. Whereas our proposed facility does not have uh, that rapidity, that picking up sediment, it does not impact uh, the movement of, uh, mm -hmm. of fish because we're keeping to the same rate. Of, of flow of uh, of their today. Um, so that is what you can make your This might provide a better um, understanding of this of the water intake interactions with Northern Bay. So so for example, these uh, this is what an artist's uh, representation of the, the concept of these uh, in, in the uh, outlet systems. So there will be 20 of these ratchets. Uh, in about a kilometer and a half diameter rough um, uh, disbursement. And these risers would be uh, roughly, you know, like 12 meters or more in, in height, so roughly the size of a school bus. So these will be very large um, uh, intake systems. Um, but uh, the water column uh, will be roughly double that. Uh, so we're still going to have basically a school bus worth of, of clearance between the top of where that uh, boat is located uh, and then the top of like the so interactions with uh, pleasure craft or other vessels uh, should be minimized. And I should also add, uh, this is still within uh, Transport Canada's safety zone or hazard zone around uh, the Department of National Defense Line. So recreational voting is uh, usually not allowed uh, in that facility. Thank you. Um, 
design for that upper reservoir where we are we recognize that this will be impermeable. So lake water does not interact with any other sources of natural water to be uh in the close proximity to um and then lastly for the water quality itself and for screening uh the soggy and Ojibwe nation environmental groups um and local photographers have been extremely interested to know about like screening and design of these water intake systems especially when it comes to fish and fit and efficient bags um so right now we are continuing to refine this design in collaboration with the Ojibwe nation and, and, the, and the fishing communities to ensure that uh, minimal Fish and fish habitat um, take place. Mm -hmm. And this not just meets or exceeds any federal or provincial standards when it comes to the fish, uh, fish impact, but also the soggy and the nation's own impact uh, standards when it comes to fish and fish impact. Um, so we look forward to continuing that refinement and demonstrating that uh, that uh, uh, that protection through a federal and provincial impact assessment process that has not even begun yet. Um, so there'll be a multi-year, multi-round process for demonstrating that those facts, um, inviting people to, to comment or, or challenge the, that, that, that science, and then ultimately the, the Department of Fisheries and Open Oceans, Ministry of Environment, Ministry of Natural Resources will make a final determination on what is uh, in the final Yeah, because right at the moment, some in Canada have they're doing you know multiple fish studies around the peninsula and a wider area. And one of my concerns would be, and, and what we do know, uh, my family, uh, out of Cobra Murray, especially the Hudson family, has been fishermen for many, many generations. But uh, we do know water temperature has even minimal changes in water temperature it does have an impact on fish habitat, movement, Etc. So I guess my question would be, we're pumping water here, and okay, it's a quick turnover, but if you leave, you're pumping water, you're leaving it in a, like say on a hot summer day, or even a cold winter day, whatever, you're pumping water into a reservoir for say 24 hours. My concern would be that, and then running it through a turbine back into the lake. I think my concern, and it's your pocket, you know, a huge volume uh, would be the impact on the water temperature from the time it leaves Georgian Bay until the time it goes back into Georgian Bay because uh, temperature does have, as far as these studies which Son are involved in, I do believe, I don't think anything um, really like uh, Herman has been, like they're in process. But it's just knowledge that temperatures is highly uh, impactful to uh, uh, life in, in, in the lakes. Yeah. Yeah. So um, to, to respond to that, actually, I think there's a slide uh, that uh, shows the, the science of uh, different studies. That's slide five. Um, so to your point about the water temperature, that was the very first question the second intervention asked us. Uh, as well as the photographers in the meter was water temperature. They are very, very well attuned to water temperature is really a huge driving factor in terms of fish and fish out. Um, and so our, uh, our our computer modeling has uh, has indicated that um, our, whether it's radiant heat being absorbed by like the sun or the cold temperatures on the on the cold day, uh, uh, the a change in temperature <clears throat> is we're talking about fractions of a degree potential um, in, in changes of, uh, of temperature and compounding that whether it's being brought in through those inlet outlet systems or released through those inlet outlet systems if it's a fraction of a degree being dispersed over a wide area they are our computer modeling has indicated and size and the nation's uh, measurements have indicated they're actually struggling to measure that change in, uh, in in temperature to the point where they can't measure it. Um, this is in contrast to potentially say people seen uh, nuclear power stations that would have multiple degrees change um, in temperature uh, through a central location that would be dispersed. So um, through and as you mentioned, the Saudi and Jewish nation has been doing their own uh, fish studies. Um, they have been on this particular project. They have already done their own independent study. 
uh, and they continue to do fish surveys and fish habitat studies um, in novels so like they get better understand um, impacts, especially temperature changes. And so far, what they have seen has been very encouraging uh, when it comes especially to, to, to temperature control and, uh, and, uh, and measurements. Thank you. Just one more question. Um, while you're here and you can come up here on the book, uh, because we have uh, a pretty broad uh, exposure to Georgia today. Um, when this, how does this uh, benefit the Bruce Peninsula? We have uh, a grid from Owen Sound up to Bruce Peninsula that at this point can barely service our needs here. It's a serious, serious problem. Uh, the National Park has been looking at ways to electrify and do various things, but the grid capacity, especially when it reaches the northern end of the peninsula, is being depleted. So how would the energy that's created from this project benefit our municipality? Um, yeah, through the chair, so uh, the... Um... Both PC, uh, so I think the Nation, Ministry of Energy, uh, and Ministry of Economic Development and, and Trades are all looking at that question right now. Uh, in fact, there are, there's a letter uh, that's there that circulated to uh, Council here where the Minister of Energy has specifically asked PC and the independent electricity operator to demonstrate broader societal benefits of why this project should, should move forward. So we're looking forward to providing that information to the uh, provincial panel. Uh, and also to others that have asked this, uh, this question. Um, so the, the immediate kind of benefits is first and foremost reliability. Um, so by providing zero energy, zero emission energy to the energy grid in a stable and reliable fashion through this hydro pump storage project at scale, grid level um, storage facility, it provides stability to it in the future. So for example, um, as we move forward, uh, in Ontario, reliability is going to be a big, big challenge. Uh, more potential spikes in energy demand as people turn on their air conditioners all at the same time, plug in their cars all at the same time. Um, I did the McLean Engineering and Miners in Northeast Ontario. The, uh, the mining industry and heavy equipment off, uh, industry is electrifying faster than any other industry. Uh, and all those well, requirements need electricity. Um, so as you have more surging demand for electricity, the grid will have a harder and harder time to maintain that reliability of providing even and consistent flow power uh, through the existing infrastructure. By providing basically an insurance policy, um, a buffer of a, a thousand megawatt storage facility, it provides that kind of stabilizer to like energy grid, where all of a sudden if there's a spike in demand and then that really trips like the wires that start doing blackouts, start doing brownouts in order to maintain that reliability of the network. This then can be brought in at a moment's notice to provide that kind of stability. So um, un unfortunately, uh, you know, Councillor, I can't promise that new wires will be developed and, uh, and, and more infrastructure in this part of the world. But I can say that this project has been designed to avoid surges in demand and, and an ongoing instable energy grid which may be good for Southern Ontario, but uh, sometimes things we're expected to provide things, but we need to know that at some point. <laughs> some of the stuff that actually benefits us in our area, but I thank you and I'll leave. Okay, thank you. Um, but again, I, I haven't been able to speak to this thing for 30 or 40 minutes. All we have last year, going over the science and behind this, and it's really very impressive. Um, one of the criticisms that I'm going to keep coming up on is it says it's a bad economic deal for Ontario. Yes, I, I don't see any numbers anywhere. So I don't know where this criticism is coming from. Maybe it's correct. Uh, yeah, so to, to, to the chair, so um, a common thing that we've heard from, uh, uh, from people is that uh, they see a very large civil infrastructure project, a very large energy project, and they immediately jump to the fact that this is some kind of uh, a boondog or 
it's something that the rate payers are going to pay for, but any debt that's called. Uh, but that, uh, unfortunately, that is not the case. That is not how Ontario has built energy projects, uh, especially uh, energy projects of this size uh, for, uh, for uh, many years. And this is specifically why uh, BC Energy and the Select Energy of the Nation have asked Ontario to treat us the same as Ontario Power Generation and Hydro One and Bruce Power. And that is through a rate regulated process. So the Ontario Energy Board is the licensor of energy facilities in Ontario. So through the Ontario Energy Board, it was a judicial process, really for, for energy projects. So you basically put together a rate case a court proceeding to, to ask the government of Ontario, these are all our costs that, that we have, have incurred that we list in order to build this project for you, Ontario. Um, and we're asking for reimbursement of this cost at a modest rate of return. And that modest rate of return is the same return that Ontario Power Generation gets after one gets, our gets, which is usually single digit, uh, maybe 10% uh, return um, from the investment. Uh, this is not, you know, 30% return investment and it's gone, you know, like the next month. So this is still multi decade uh, investment. Uh, and then within that broad group of costs, the Energy Board will look, will look at um, interveners are intervening on those cases all the time, especially pension plans. Uh, and they say, well, these are not eligible costs, and these are not eligible costs. And then the process gets dwindled down to those that Ontario does be, would be prudently incurred. And only those costs that would then be reimbursed uh, to, uh, to the proponent. This, this process has been in place for multiple decades. Uh, it has provided some certainty to uh, uh, project proponents to build large civil infrastructure that will cost multiple billions of dollars to build. Um, and in the absence of outright competition, where you have 17 or 20 different, you know, forms to compete, regulating the industry is, 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 uh, is the best uh, move to uh, pass forward this budget and raise your dollars. Thank you. Hello. 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 So, you know, in the past, I was so passionate about the story of the particularly in this event. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, uh, so this is for the chair, we've had um, a, a very long conversation. That conversation is ongoing with the independent electricity operator regarding the value of this project. And I should say from the outset, the independent electricity operator did not ask for this project. Uh, this is an unsolicited um, idea that PC has come to Ontario with. Because our our energy analysts have looked at Ontario, uh, and they've seen electrification take place in New York, and Pennsylvania, and California, and Texas, and they said, Ontario, you're going to need something like this. And more importantly, they looked at those other facilities, uh, like Pennsylvania, Massachusetts, uh, Michigan, the Carolinas, and they said, huh, oh, they all seem to have a long duration home storage facility in those jurisdictions, and they also seem to be doing pretty well. Uh, maybe Ontario, we should consider something like this. So that was the rationale or interest that came from PC, not from the government of Ontario. Uh, the government of Ontario has been open so far to entertaining this idea. This is why Ontario created uh, a multi gate process to understand the value of this project. Um, on the electricity operator, because they have never really had to study a long duration energy storage facility on its own, completely independent, say from Hydro One or from other facilities. Um, it's 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 unconventional, uh, and unconventional ideas take time to consider. Um, so we're in that process right now, uh, and uh, as the chair has circulated uh, a letter uh, from earlier this year, from January, uh, where the Minister of Energy has been uh, directing ISO to uh, think outside the box, uh, indicate that there's broader societal benefits. There is still rate payer value that has to be assessed, uh, but that process is still ongoing uh, with the uh, with the
So um, through the chair, actually, there's a slide, um, slide, slide seven uh, that actually shows an overview of the, the exact location of this uh, of the proposed facility on those military lines. So yeah, it, it is being proposed uh, for the uh, Fourth Canadian Division Training Center in Meeper, uh, you know, known as the Meeper Tank Range. Uh, and um, so there's a very specific reason why we've chosen Meeper, and then specifically that location within those 20,000 acres that make up the military. So, so first, uh, Meaford in general, um, everything aligns for Meaford to be located for a long duration home storage facility. If you, you can't put them, you know, in downtown Toronto, they, they all have to be at certain things. So the elevation is there, 600 feet, that provides an ideal elevation to create that basically an artificial waterfall, free hydro generation. Um, it is still in southern Ontario, uh, so the transmission components are valuable and, and, and pretty efficient. To get energy to that facility and then export energy out. Uh, and um, it has the ideal access uh, to like the water itself. So we are not privatizing more of the shoreline. Uh, the Department of National Defense has allowed us the opportunity to investigate, but the opportunity to use public lands for a public good. Uh, and uh, the Department of National Defense still has to make a final determination if they can still maintain their mission, uh, train troops. While having this facility in proximity to uh, to their activities, so all those things have to align for Meeper to be located, uh, both sites be located here. Uh, within the military base, uh, that military base is roughly twenty thousand acres. Uh, we would be taking up say less than five hundred acres. So let's say two percent of the base, two and a half percent of the base would be uh, part of this uh, facility. Uh, in um, in twenty seventeen. Let's say we had an initial thinking of putting um, our facility roughly two and a half kilometers north of where it's located um, on on your base uh, on your map in there. Um, at that location, we, we shared that with the uh, Department of National Defense, and they flatly said, "No, we were never going to build anything in that location because of issues of contaminants, uh, issues of historic use." Uh, they said it's unsafe and unwise for you to locate anything in that facility. So we changed it. Uh, so in the current location right here on your screen, it is roughly about two, two and a half kilometers south of where that original was located. In that location, the Department of National Defense is a much nicer outlook to, to, what our, to what we're proposing. That's not to say that, it's, that it, nothing will happen ever. We will have to develop, and, and we are will be committed to um, brownfield remediation, contamination remediation. But so far, um, our indication is that uh, any sites that are in that area have been closed, meaning that they have been remediated, or when they investigated, there was nothing to do uh, for that thing. For that purpose. But in addition to that, if we do discover something, we will have to be and we will be responsible for uh, containment, remediation, and cleanup before construction can I just have one quick question. When will the sign get your final stamp of approval? Uh, through the chair. Um, uh, timeline has not been uh, provided to us yet. Uh, the the site and the donation are going through a community based decision making process now. Uh, the only agreement the PC has with the site and the at this point is called a pathways agreement. That pathways agreement basically spells out um, you want to be partners. So we have to do certain things in order to demonstrate trust, demonstrate open communication in order to build that partnership um, so that uh, we can be in a position to do a partnership later on. Um, so TC Energy and the Saudi Energy Foundation have both been doing certain activities like collaborating on environmental studies, collaborating on design, uh, being quite open and honest about what uh, we need and what the Saudi Energy Foundation needs in order to advance a relationship. Um, so we're looking forward the hearing from the Saudi of Jibunation about how their community-based decision-making is unfolding. But at this point, um, 
they have not uh, made a final decision. Uh, but we're looking forward to the hearing from them very soon. Um, and then just I mean, you know, sort of long term monitoring the philosophical uh, internet and you know, the normal and all these uh, very tough things, relatively long and bright and And then, yeah, so to the chair, uh, we are anticipating as, as conditions of the federal impact assessment, there, there will be requirements of doing meeting of long term studies. Uh, of certain activities, especially fish or water quality uh, um, uh, activities. Uh, typically, those are usually one year, two year, five year uh, uh, intervals. We're fully expecting those and anticipating those. In addition to that, uh, the Saudi and Ojibwe Nation as part of their environmental stewardship, um, say, covenants of, of being a partner, they will require the facility to provide monitoring and reporting and also participation of Saudi and Ojibwe Nation monitors. Uh, for long-term monitoring of the facility um, as well. So there will be uh, federal crown requirements and also fucking um, uh, Ojibwe Nation requirements as well. All right. All right. Uh, Darren, you have to Thanks, Lon. Thank you. May I uh, add, uh, if you do have any questions uh, or concerns, uh, our office in Maple is open uh, at all times. Um, I'm based out of Meaford. On um, Thursdays, we have a coffee chat. So any resident can, uh, can stop by and have a coffee and a muffin and uh, learn about this project. And uh, and also, I think our, our ask uh, today is uh, if you do have questions, uh, please contact us. You know, we're more than happy to provide evidence based information uh, to, to councils and local, local residents. Um, and uh, thank you for your time. Thank you. All right, on our second volume, we will be joined by the team and we will be joined by the team and we will be joined by the team. Ben, are you with us? Hi, everybody. Yeah, we can hear you. Go ahead. Great. So uh, thanks so much for inviting me uh, here today. I, I want to start out by saying, um, you know, the Georgian Bay and the Bruce is a place uh, where I've actually visited uh, all through my childhood. Uh, so my family made a tradition of, of camping in the Bruce Peninsula uh, since I was a young boy. And then my friends and I have often gone camping there as well. We've been through Tobermory, Tobermory countless times. So uh, it's a place that holds a, a little bit of like a special uh part of my background. Um, and so I'm particularly excited to be able to work on this project and, and to speak to you today about uh, what's being planned. Uh, in, a, in a nutshell, a little bit about myself and, and our company. We're a technology company that specializes in tourism and particularly in ecotourism uh, using smartphone applications. So this allows us to do things like create uh, self-guided tours, as well as providing tourists with the right information at the right time, whether it's storytelling or uh, uh, connecting them to key assets and resources uh, for their for their stay. So we've operated uh, quite significantly across Ontario. Um, our clients include downtown Toronto, uh, downtown Ottawa, as well as uh, other corporate clients like the CN Tower and uh, Bell Canada. And what I'm here to talk to you about today is a really exciting project that's been sort of building momentum over the last few years. And the vision is to create the world's largest UNESCO geopark along the Georgian Bay. And if you're not familiar with geoparks, essentially it's the United Nations Environment um, uh, uh, Program essentially designates places of exceptional uh, quality and uniqueness, uh, both ecologically, culturally, environmentally in the world. So there are a number of geoparks uh, uh, across uh, the globe, and there's three or four of them in Canada. Um, so there's been a tremendous support for the development of this geopark, and we're working with a, a range of partners, including uh, National Geographic, NASA, uh, with a number of tourism destination marketing organizations, 
and provincial government uh, organizations as well. And our goal is to curate the, uh, the coast in a way that allows people to experience its geologic history as well as its geocultural meaning. And that includes uh, indigenous storytelling as well as history, arts, culture. And all of that is curated through uh, the, our app uh, as an experience to the end user. Uh, one of the one of the particulars of note uh, in this project is the goal to educate tourists on what I would call respectful tourism. So being able to uh, contribute to the regeneration and maintenance of this region from an environmental perspective and also helping to manage problems of over tourism, which is which I know is a problem. So with all that being said, um, I'll, I'll ask you to just go to the next slide there. So one of the core features of this platform is social hiking. So we're going to be inviting people to go and hike together and uh, bring up, bringing in data that will inform people about things like weather alerts, trail conditions, uh, what's the trail length, how difficult is it? So we're able to provide sort of an intelligent companion for uh, the hiking experience that also connects to nearby businesses. So it will provide advertising to tourists that will say, hey, I know you've been out hiking for a while with your friends, how about lunch or how about a coffee or a beer? And it sort of integrates that into the experience. And this is a feature that we've actually developed with the Trans Canada Trail, who's one of our, our partners on this project. Uh, and I'll ask you to just move to the next slide, please. Another one of the uh, features of this platform is a technology called augmented reality. And if you haven't heard of augmented reality or AR um, as it's uh, shortened, it's the ability to create 3D visualizations. So we take three dimensional stories and we essentially overlay them onto the real world. And now this is one of the uh, one of the art forms that we've really enhanced a lot of uh, cities uh, as well as museums, national historic sites, and working as well with festivals and artists to deploy these 3D experiences in the public realm for people to enjoy. One of the goals of the Trans Canada Trail project is to create uh, uh, augmented reality storytelling at every trailhead um, across the country. So there is planned for 13 provinces, 13 experiences over the next five years. And we're actually launching that uh, in Ottawa in June. And then the plan is to expand from there. Then I'll ask you just to go to the, uh, the next slide, please. And this is, uh, this is a really key piece of this effort, which is recognizing that we want to increase the economic impact of this natural asset that is the Jordan Bay. And that happens by connecting visitors with businesses in real time that makes it uh, connects to their to their experience. That includes things like you know uh, 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 hospitality, accommodations, uh, also uh, leisure, uh, leisure and recreational, uh, which could be like a new rental, let's say for example. So we are develop a database of all those assets. Um, working with partners in GIS to be able to curate this information at just the right time that's going to get that buying commitment, that conversion into revenue. And the great thing is, this also allows us to, to quantize and measure that economic impact and provide reporting. But, and this allows us to make a case uh, to, for uh, further investment in the area. It allows us also to measure how people move through the area and interact with different aspects of the Bay. And with that, um, that really completes the, the presentation. What I'm really asked for this opportunity to speak to you today was to understand how, it, how we could integrate with the municipality and the resources of the businesses, for example, in, in Tobermory to be able to provide that curated business experience. Now, this is something we're developing in townships all along the coast. Um, and we're early on in this process. 
right? So this, this is a five to 10 year strategy uh, and we're beginning to campaign and, and we've raised some initial funding and we're gonna be developing the first version of the experience uh, later this year. So with that, I'd love to know any questions that uh, anyone has. And I, I would ask too that the sound quality is a little bit iffy. So if you could go right up close to the mic, I'd, I'd appreciate it so I can hear you. Um, thanks. All right, uh, thank you now. Uh, any questions on this? It appears that we're all digesting. <laughs> but uh, you said three. Yeah. Um, what is like that? What, what was like that? As we talk to the old fashioned market, what was the sort of old fashioned ground? I'm sorry, I'm having a real hard time picking up uh, any of the audio. Apologies. Sorry, um, I'm just asking, what was the um, common like, um, part um, in scale? Like, is there any physical construction involved or is this like purely in the digital? Yeah, that's a great question. So uh, it's, it's going to be purely digital. And essentially what we're going to be doing is connecting um, all of those physical assets and, and infra tourism infrastructure uh, and curating it to uh, to visitors and residents. Thank you. Um, so basically, uh, this is paid for by advertising. Is that correct? That's that's yeah. part of the funding model. You know, we're all we're also and technically, like we're vendors that work for the Geopark organization. That organization has a couple different fundraising streams. Um, one of them is grants. Um, another one is uh, funding from tourism destination marketing organizations, BIAs and municipalities. And then there's also a uh, plan for sponsorships. But yes, there will be some uh, revenue generated through ads. Now those ads, I, I will mention, uh, are always uh, hyper-localized. Like they're meant to advertise only local businesses to tourists that are nearby to them with the goal of really having a local uh, economic uh, growth. Okay, that, that's important. Um, the other thing is you said there are some of these in Canada. Where exactly would they be? So there's one other uh, geopark that I'm familiar with. It's called Tumblr Ridge. Tumblr Ridge is in uh, BC, and they're they're interesting. Um, their unique sort of ecological differentiator is they have a ton of fossils. So people who like dinosaurs, they'll go and and even tourists can find fossils there. And there's a whole museum that sort of curates that experience. And it's been interesting actually because since the designation, like they started out as a coal mining town, really. And it was, that was the only way that they sustained their economy. And now it has totally transformed. So now they've got bakeries and cafes and, uh, you know, bike and, and, uh, and winter recreation rental. So all these businesses popped up since the launch of that geopark. And we're expecting something kind of similar economically across the coast as, as we build up this project. So all of the content on here is developed by Geopark or does, is there an uh, opportunity for input? What we have found here on the Bruce Peninsula is once certain areas become, uh, you know, well, it happened with social media or a little better known, they become overrun and it becomes an issue. So uh you have this platform it sounds kind of amazing so what if we get a situation where one of the areas where you've decided to focus on does become uh too uh visited like we uh do depend on our tourism and we are certainly all in favor of informed visitors appreciate the area 
But if we get into a situation like that, as does a municipality or say we have the national parks, like where where do our local opinions and issues come into play here? I mean, that's a great question. And, you know, over tourism, and I think you, you raised a great point. So, Uh, hi, Ben. Hello. Can you hear me? Uh, the, the, the audio is very poor, so I'm not sure what happened. It was good. Just, just a sec. We need to do, uh, to explain that again. Wait, wait till we see if we can correct it. Try it now, then. Uh, you lost them. Okay. Sorry. Yeah. Oh, he's back. Hi, everyone. Sorry about that uh, little intermission there. Um, the last question, if you could explain that one to us again, please. Yeah, so there's there's sort of two components to the answer to that question. The first is providing education resources before people visit. So that's something that we deliver through the app into, for example, classrooms, people's homes, and it provides a sort of interactive education and play around the, around the geopark. So if you can imagine, for example, uh, we're taking... Uh, data from from NASA's satellites that creates a top topography. It creates a shape of the landscape, and then what we'll do is we'll create three D like holograms that tell the visitor all about the the climate story, the environmental story, the geologic story, and it it builds uh, an emotional connection and an understanding with the fragility of that environment because we want to attract the right tourist that's gonna treat this place with respect. So that is planned to be integrated into the school system. Uh, we're working with the University of Toronto on that particular aspect of it. So that education piece is a really big opportunity. The second thing is our system has a dynamic way of, of um, basically routing tourists when there's too much usage on a particular spot. So if we see that there's a surge of activity in a particular area, we can actually direct tourists to a different uh, opportunity. So that allows us to bet to intelligently manage the flow of usage. And that and we're hoping, and we haven't yet, but we're hoping to integrate with the provincial parks as well, so that we can um, have that data be as, as accurate in real time as possible. In terms of the local connection as well, you know, we want to we want to collaborate at every level. This is a grassroots project, right? So we want to hear the thoughts of locals and, and folks from the municipality to understand what are the problems and challenges here that we could possibly overcome with technology and wh what are the opportunities as well. From a storytelling perspective, you know, there's not really like, um, we don't have restrictions on the type of stories we want to tell. So we're able to talk about local history as well as, you know, geology, as well as indigenous storytelling. So for example, creating walking tours in Tobamori that have a history of that place as a town would, would be something that we would be very interested in creating as well. So it's a collaborative project. And our goal is to, um, is to take all of that cultural storytelling that gives meaning to this place that, for example, that I have come to love through my experience as a kid and deliver it to people in a way that's fun and simple to use. Uh, does that answer your question? Yes, sir. Initially, yes, thank you. Uh, yeah, and just one final question. You said 
and partner with municipalities, I believe. But uh, what does that mean? So when, when partnering with municipality, usually we're looking at the economic development departments uh, and tourism, where those are part of the municipality. And the goal is to, for example, we're, we're trying to drive specific eco economic metrics. So that could be, for example, increased foot traffic in like a main street type area, increased dwell time, uh, more conversions to sales for local businesses. Um, and, and like you mentioned too, educating tourists before they come. It very it is very much a tourism and economic development perspective that we're focused on. Okay. All right. Any other questions? If not, on behalf of the council staff, thank you. Okay. I'm sorry, I, I missed that last question. No, there was no question. Oh, uh, okay. So yeah, at least on behalf of our council and staff, thank you for the presentation. Uh, it's, 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 been, it's been a pleasure. Um, I'm sure I'll be up this summer to uh, to get into the lake and um, just really appreciate all of your time. Um, I'll, I'll definitely be circling back as this project is advancing um, so that we can hopefully have an impact in this area. Um, so thanks a lot. And if you ha have any further questions, uh, my email is ben at xrstudios.com uh, and feel free to reach out anytime and I'll be happy to chat with you. Thank you. Okay, have a great day, everybody. You as well. Take care. All right. Uh, we will go to our uh, agenda. Actually, last meeting, I uh, we have to be a public meeting after the bylaws. And we have to make a public push for the budget. The budget goes to us. But I think that they, they did a great job. And we feel as if we did the budget. And we don't. Even though we were probably shy in some areas. But, but okay. it, it, I thought that they did a good job. I think they did a good job. I want to talk to you again, Joe. And next, we have only the presentation 25 year service award from the Office of Fireman to the Fire Chief. So, Mr. Totally on the Totally on the So, yeah. Yeah. 
So what see my dad? What's your dad do? So um dash A. I believe that they refer to um it, they recognize detached dwellings within commercial zones. So any of those houses that were existing prior to the area of being zoned out. Um, so C1 A, it um, meshes with the short term accommodation provisions better in the sense that it has to be an entire dwelling rented out. It can't just be an apartment above a business. So that's why when council asks for an expansion into the commercial zone, this zoning aligns with that request better. So that's the Yes, so um, in conversations with Chief Building Official when we took it, yeah. it was determined that this zoning would better suit the short term accommodation program uh, because of that entire premise being included within the right. All right, thank you. Any other questions? No, I was just looking at the same thing. I don't know what we can take on C1A and what we want Just the importance of ensuring you have your best of making sure when people you know that well we have some of the same in the rate but that they are well aware of what the c1 is in fact and uh, yeah thank you all right i agree with the decision public work report Right. Once again, we can see the increases here as well, far beyond the eight percent that we're looking at. So, any questions? All in favor? Opposed? The motion is carried. Next one is public works again. It's microsurfacing. We're going to second you for that one, Todd and Rod. Once again, that, that's a that's a big difference in that one. Yeah. Any questions? Call the vote. All in favor? Oppose. The motion's carried. Item number six: Fire Chief's report. 
sole source purchase of auto extrication tools. Mover and seconder for that, Smokey and Todd. Any comments on this one, yes, Smokey? Well, I was just wondering, I, I gather we're moving all to battery-operated wall. If, is there any market for the extrication tools that, I assume they still work? Is there any market for something like that? That yeah. we could sell what we have, we're not gonna be using? Yeah, our plan is we'll have two sets of hydraulic tools. We'll keep one set as a backup in case something happens with our battery operated tools and then put the other set on gup deals or put out for um for sale okay thank you any other questions call the vote all in favor Opposed. the motions carried once again fire chief's report purchase of a quick response rescue vehicle waving the uh Section 54 of our tendering policy. Mover and seconder for that one, Amon and Todd. What, did, what was it? I'm sorry, I did ask this before. What was the total purchase of that one? Uh, It'll be just under 270,000. Just under 270, okay. And then Deckling will be um, above and beyond that, which was uh, between four and 5,000. Okay. Well, yeah, I had the same question. Though. Maybe we could put that in the yes. report because you know, somebody reading it someplace else is going to say, well, that's not what they buy and how much they pay for it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. It's just another line that says. Yeah, it's probably a good idea. Yeah. If we could just amend that to include uh, the total price. Any other questions on that one? Well, just a comment. We are putting a lot of money into our fire department and emergency services. So uh, we had spoken about trying to, you know, get at least some uh, recognition from federal government that, you know, we need help with some of these. I'm just wondering if we had any uh, opportunity to um, see about that or do we think that it's tilting at windmills or but when you take a look at what our fire budget has been the last couple of years i mean i i know we need it upgraded but it's really become significant just a question if um i mean yeah. is, it, is it a waste of time but well I'll, i think i can speak to that counselor i have been having some conversations with my colleagues and the ontario association of fire chiefs executive um, we're anticipating some funding announcements coming out here shortly uh, to help smaller departments like ours with some of these cost increases. Um, we have our general conference at the beginning of May. Uh, we're anticipating that we'll see some of those uh, funding conversations happen then. And um, right now I'm planning on attending a Queen's Park Day with the Ontario Association of Fire Chiefs at the end of May. Um, to lobby on behalf of Northern Bruce Peninsula as well as Ontario for additional resources that we need in the fire service, both locally and provincially. Okay, so is that just within the provincial uh, envelope or will this have some uh, effect where we're trying to get more money from the federal level because that is really you know, a big part of what we're serving? Yeah, this, this will be, the what I just spoke about will be at the provincial level. There is still conversations going on um, at the federal level with the Canadian Association of Fire Chiefs. Um, and there's a council uh, uh, letter that's coming up here a little bit later in correspondence that talks about um, reinstating that JEP funding and stuff like that. And there's a lot of conversations happening with um, chiefs nationwide um, to reinstate some of that funding because the costs for the fire service have gone up dramatically here in the last couple of years. Like, Similar to what it works. Yeah, so that's great. That's hopefully looking at something at upper levels. We haven't thought that it's worthwhile to take a more uh, local perspective, say our MP and our local national park, to try to get them on board with this. Not as of yet, but um, 
if that's something council wishes, I'm sure we could start those conversations. Yeah, well, I think we did wish that, but uh, anyway, thank you, guys. Okay. So I guess with on the conversation, so is that that a good idea? I guess we need council to sort of agree with this. So yeah, so we will have those start those conversations. All right, and uh, so we did make a little amendment there. Who is the mover and seconder on that, Kathy? I'm on and Todd, okay, with we just included the total correct. Call the vote on this one. If there's no further questions, all in favor? Opposed? The motion is carried. Next is Fire Chief's report again, and uh, spending more money, Smokey. Yeah. Mover and seconder for this one. Uh, Rod and uh, Amon. So this is bunker. How many are we buying all together, Jack? I was hoping to buy 10 sets this year, but the cost yes. of bunker gear has gone up 14% in the last year. So this is going to reduce that to eight okay. sets. Uh, all right. Yeah. So oh, were these were, were these all within, the, these were all in the budget, right? Correct. All of these that were, we, yes, they were all. Correct. Okay, so any questions on this? Call the vote. All in favor? Motion is carried. Our chief's report again here, community emergency preparedness, and this is the grant, and this is the drone purchase. We're going to second by that, Smokey and uh, Todd. Jack, do you have any comment on that? This is uh, completely funded, including taxes yeah. with the grant, and this will include yeah. training of uh, seven pilots as well. Yep. And uh, the name of that company is Alto Helix. Alto, yeah, okay. Any questions? Call the vote. All in favor? Motion is carried. Item number 10, mover and seconder, bring that forward, Amon and Todd. This is a uh, no demand for service to agreement at 64 Howard Bowman Drive. Any questions on that one? Call the vote, all in favor. Opposed, the motion is carried. 11, mover and seconder, bring that one forward, Todd and Rod. And this is the same lot to lift the holding zone on. Any questions on that one? Call a vote. All in favor? Opposed? The motion is carried. Item number 12 is Parks and Facilities, and it's the Spruce to Bruce Community Funding Program. And uh, this report outlines where we would, uh, where our manager would, uh, staff would like to spend some money. Mover and seconder to bring that forward. Smokey and Amon. Any questions on that one? Call the vote. All in favor? Opposed? The motion is carried. Item number 12 is the treasurer's report. And it's the 2023 bylaw department allocations. Over in second to bring that one forward. Oman and Rod. Questions? Call a vote. All in favor? Opposed? The motion is carried. Item number 14, clerk's report. And this is the municipal drainage committee. And it looks like we have obtain some interested parties for this one. So mover and seconder to bring it forward. Rod and Amon. Any questions on this one? And Todd, you were you were the one we picked for that. Yes. yes. Yeah. So that's that's a total of five on five voting members on that committee. 
Okay. All right. <clears throat> Any questions, comments, call the vote, all in favor? Post the motion's carried. 15 is the clerk's report and delegation deputation policy. And I, I like this. This is uh, kind of spells things out a little bit uh, for us. And that's that's good. Mover and second to bring it forward. Todd and Amon. Any questions, Todd or Amon? Uh, just one question um, on the part that uh, the topic will be not allowed a second delegation unless uh, the person can prove there is uh, new information. Um, how are we sort of judging that or evaluating that? I think this is to prevent. Sorry. I think this is to prevent Amand. Um, over the last few months, we've had kind of the same information coming back to us, just maybe under a different title. So um, we can look at it as staff, discuss it with the CAO, um, anything new instead of some of the repetitive stuff that perhaps we've had in the last few months, but under a different title. And then you've also noticed today we had a delegation come. We didn't have that material that was included in the package. Right. So in order to be accountable and transparent to everyone, um, this way when we're, we're booking a delegation now, this information will be sent out so everybody's aware yes. of, of what's happening for the delegation. Good. Any further questions? Call a vote. Oh, sorry. One more one. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Do you want to look at the limit of uh, 15 minutes? Um, it's a little too restrictive. I know it's an ideal, but I mean, I think you know, every delegation we've had so far has never lasted 15 minutes, even like once today. So that actually in our procedural bylaw, that is at the call of the mayor. He can cut it off after 15 minutes okay. if he chooses. Okay. Yeah. All right. Um, there's no further questions. Call the vote. All in favor? Post the motion is carried. And clerk's report is again here. It is a severance uh, on Bradley Drive. Uh, mover and seconder for that one. Smokey. Smokey, do you? Yes. Uh, well, uh, and I do have a question on it. Second drive. Yep. Go ahead, Smokey. Oh, well, well it's a zone like zoning. And I just. Curious, I know uh, Wendy's not here, but on this, we're only leaving a 25 foot um, access to the um, the year round road. Like, what is the standard? That just seems like um, a recipe for a problem. But um, I'm just asking the question because I've never seen that before. Um, and I would assume that that is normally, uh, you know, more space is required than that. Actually, I'll let our public works manager, he actually did a site visit for this particular application. Yeah, and I actually, uh, Councillor Golden, that I believe that 25 foot access was was already there. It was off a of previous severance. If I'm correct, so this is actually they're applying for another severance off the other corner. So that 25 foot severance was there before, and I believe it was for access to the back of the the property. So we're just kind of dealing with an access that was already there. What what just for my own information, what is normally uh, considered, uh, you know, minimum? Because if you have any kind of drainage or anything at all, like I said, 25 feet. Like this has already been there and whatever, but it's certainly not desirable, I wouldn't think. No, certainly not. And, and I mean, it depends on the on what use on what use you're looking at. Uh, um, when if this application was more than just a residential, you know, a property going into it, it, you would probably want something a little wider. But uh, you know, twenty five feet, your normal driveway is, you know. 15, 20, 20 foot culvert, right? So it is what so you were putting. So there's no actual minimum stated as far as. I would have to have our planning department okay. answer that, but I, I, I'm not, yeah. But uh, as far as the, uh, an entrance onto the roadway, no. Okay. It's just, Thank usually you. we like to see 20, you know, 15, 15, 20 feet. Thank you. 
If you want to, maybe, you know, just if you go to uh, page 10 of this report. So that, that little piece there. This one here. Is that what you were talking about? What is that? Like, what, what is the, what are these two lines here? And I'm trying to. The ones at dimension lines. Okay, so it's not identifying anything here. No, we actually had to ask clarification for that too during yeah. the comments process. Okay. Yeah, so that's the dimension of the of the retained. Good. And actually this um Report will be coming before council on the eighth. There'll be a, a zoning application yep. coming. So, yep. if you need any further clarification at that time, sounds good. All right. Any further comments, questions? Call the vote. All in favor? Opposed? The motion is carried. Clerk's report again. It's cancellation. Uh, it's identifying our Christmas holidays for two thousand twenty-four. <laughs> you, it's good to know, right? You have to plan. Okay, mover and second for this. I'm on. And Todd. Any questions? All in favor? Opposed? The motion is carried. Clerk's report again is uh, item 18. And this is at 62 Cape Herd Road, former township of St. Edmunds, municipality of Northern Bruce Peninsula. Um, another severance application here. Mover and second to bring this forward. Rod and Amon. Any questions on this one? I am pleased to see a drainage plan necessary because, as we all know, even the municipality has ditched that road trying to, there is the cars, there is the sinkholes in that uh, ditch in front of that whole road, which the municipality has cleaned out in recent years. So, yeah, it definitely needs uh, that. Any further questions on that one? Call a vote on this. All in favor? Opposed? The motion is carried. <clears throat> Number 19, CAO report. Proposal for a research and council workshop. Move on second, bring this forward. Rod, you have to be the one on this. Yeah. <laughs> I'll yeah, smoky, yeah. Um, questions? Any comments on this, Peggy? Yeah, so basically, um, we're looking at a phased in approach. So at that point, council can either cancel the project after phase one is done or continue on at a certain cost. Um, the first part of the phasing is to have a meeting with council, uh, to see where the concerns are and to also look at the background of the previous funding models plus what we're currently funding and bring all that information back to council with a provision as to how do we move forward with this um so uh the fifteen thousand uh, dollars as council is aware we did have i believe fifty fifty thousand in reserves that we removed from the development charge study so 30 sorry 30 <laughs> thank you um so we have that has been placed back in reserves uh we could allocate that back to this project should council wish to move forward
Is number one, information, reports, so. Yeah, I just had a question. I just wondered uh, where we are with that. Like, I'm a little fuzzy what we were asking our lawyer, if you could, and where, when it comes back to us or where we are in this process and exactly what we're expecting to hear from a lawyer. All right. So um, where we are in the process is council to approve the policy. Um, if I can make comments regarding this letter, the policy that council approved was actually provided through um, FCM. Uh, it has been used by other municipalities and has been backed up that um, <clears throat> essentially as a municipality, we are here as a commenting agency to gather information and to see if the communication process was concurrent or not concurrent with ISED. And at that point, we pass it on to ISED. A lot of the concerns that... Um, the uh, the resident has regarding this are items that we actually do not have any uh, form of control over, and these are all things that ISED would actually do. Um, regarding comments uh, from our lawyers, what we're looking at right now is uh, because we are in the middle of our policy change, we went from having um, our consultant work it, and now we're actually um, in control of the communication process. Um, does Share Tower have to start over again? So that's essentially what our lawyers are looking at right now. Currently, we haven't received any comments back. I did talk to him last week, and he is working on his his follow up letter for us. Um, where the project has is right now is that Share Towers has provided us with their communication files, and once our CBO is back, she will be reviewing the uh, file itself. Once that review is complete, a report will come to council. All right. Uh, thank you. So, uh, next on the agenda is the town of uh, Coburg, and uh, it's identifying the affordability of water and wastewater systems, sustainable affordability of uh, in rural and small urban municipalities. That's the town of Coburg. I think we should support this. Move by Smokey, second by Amon. We support that. All in favor? Opposed? Carried. Uh, the municipality of Calvin, uh, National Firefighting Strategy. We have our fire chief, right? Okay. We have our fire chief right here. Did you have a question? No, I I just think we should support it, yes. Yeah, uh, fire chief here, so we'll just hear a little comment from him. Yeah, after reading this uh, resolution from the municipality of Calvin, I, I think um, I'd recommend to council that we support this. Yes. There's some very okay. good information in here that's very Talk actual. And um, <clears throat> call a vote. All in favor? Opposed? The motion is carried. <clears throat> Township of uh, Pusslinch, Social and Economic Prosperity Review. Um, Where do we stand on this one? Support? Uh, and yeah. Motion supported as well. Yeah. Yes. Well, moved by Amon. Second by Todd. Call the vote. All in favor? Opposed? The motion is carried. And next one is item number five. Um, um, I'll show the support this one too. Yeah. Yeah. This here is the operating button, and this is this is a pretty good one here, actually, as well. It sounds like a lot of municipalities are the same of us, realizing we have been downloaded more than our rate payers can possibly or should be supporting. And uh, yeah, well, I agree with this also, as well. Yeah, it's also pointing out, uh, you know, the city of Toronto has the lowest tax rates and. Now, mind you, their assessments are quite high, but uh, 
Yeah, and, and but it's good to support they they take as well. So Newburn sector for support. I'm on and not smoking. Um call a vote on this one. All in favor? Opposed? I hope it's carried. And I believe this is the one we brought back from the last meeting, I believe. So um I don't know what your thought on this one, but uh, I think it's premature at this point. I don't, have, I don't, yes. I, I think we'll file it if that's good. Yeah. For now, yes. Until if we get other information that we are really in, yeah. and, but for right now. Yeah. Um, I really didn't understand the project as well as I, I, I still don't really that well, but I do a little bit better now. And so file uh, was a lawn and brought. Uh, call a vote on that. All in favor? Both the motion carry. We'll move to buy Oh, sorry, we have one information, one Kathy. Yes, yeah, so I was just going to ask if we can put one in six in under information. Yes, okay. One one in six and it, it will be Included with that TC energy one. So one and six. So who is the mover and seconder? Amond and Rod. Amond and Rod, okay with that. All right. So one and six are on in the information one. Bylaws. And a bylaw lift the holding zone and another one confirmatory bylaws. Mover and seconder for bylaws, Todd and smoking. Any questions on bylaws? All the vote, all in favor. Opposed, the motion is carried. Closed session, no. Motion to adjourn, right? And come on. All in favor. Motion carried. Mm -hmm.